La Promere de Fon by William Faulkner Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I follow through the singing trees her streaming clouded hair and face, and lascivious dreaming knees like gleaming water from some place of sleeping streams or autumn leaves slow shed through still love-wearied air. She pauses, and as one who grieves shakes down her blown and vagrant hair to veil her face, but not her eyes, a hot quick spark each sudden glance, or like the wild brown bee that flies sweet-winged, a sharp extravagance of kisses on my limbs and neck. She whirls and dances through the trees that lift and sway like arms and fleck her with quick shadows, and the breeze lies on her short and circled breast. Now hand in hand with her I go, the green night and the silver west of virgin stars, pale row on row like ghostly hands, and ere she sleep in silent meadows, dim and deep, in dreams of stars and dreaming dream. I have a nameless wish to go to some far silent midnight noon, where lonely streams whisper and flow, and sigh on sands blanched by the moon, and blonde limbed dancers whirling past the senile worn moon staring through the sighing trees, until at last their hair is powdered bright with dew and their sad slow limbs and brows and petals drifting on the breeze shed from the fingers of the boughs then suddenly on all of these a sound like some great deep bell stroke falls and they dance unclad and cold it was the earth's great heart they broke for springs before the world grew old End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Lords by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason Mills. It is little I repair to the matches of the South Rom folk, though my own red roses there may blow. It is little I repair to the matches of the South Rom folk, though the red roses crest the caps, I know. For the field is full of shades as I near a shadowy coast, And a ghostly batsman plays to the bowling of a ghost, And I look through my tears on a soundless clapping host, As the run-stealers flicker to and fro, to and fro, Oh, my Hornby and my Barlow long ago! It's Gloucester coming north, the irresistible, The Shire of the Graces long ago! It's Gloucestershire up north, the irresistible, a new-risen Lancashire the foe, a shire so young that has scarce impressed its traces. Ah, how shall it stand before all resistless graces? O oh, little red rose, their bats are as maces to beat thee down this summer long ago. This day of seventy-eight they are come up north against thee, this day of seventy-eight long ago. The champion of the centuries, he cometh up against thee, with his brethren, every one a famous foe. The long-whiskered doctor that laugheth the rules to scorn, while the bowler, pitched against him, bans the day he was born. And G.F. with his science makes the fairest length forlorn. They are come from the west to work thee war. It is little I repair to the matches of the South Ron folk, though my own red roses there may blow. It is little I repair to the matches of the South Ron folk, Though the red roses crest the caps, I know. For the field is full of shades as I near a shadowy coast, And a ghostly batsman plays to the bowling of a ghost, And I look through my tears on a soundless clapping host, As the run-stealers flicker to and fro, to and fro, Oh, my Hornby and my Barlow long ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn in the Garden by Henry Van Dyke Read for LibriVox.org by Sajjad Rahmani October 2011 Oslo, Norway Sajjad.net When the frosty kiss of autumn in the dark Makes its mark on the flowers And the misty morning 
grieves over fallen leaves, then my olden garden, where the golden soil through the toil of a hundred years is mellow, rich, and deep, whispers in its sleep. Mid the crumpled beds of marigold and phlox, where the box borders with its glossy green the ancient walks, there is a voice that talks of the human hopes that bloomed and withered here year by year, dreams of joy that brightened all the laboring hours, fading as the flowers. Yet the whispered story does not deepen grief, but relief, for the loneliness of sorrow seems to flow from the long ago. When I think of other lives that learned, like mine, to resign, and remember that the sadness of the fall comes alike to all. What regrets, what longings for the lost were theirs, and what prayers for the silent strength that nerves us to endure things we cannot cure. Pacing up and down the garden where they paced, I have traced all their well-worn paths of patience till I find comfort in my mind. Faint and far away their ancient griefs appear, yet how near is the tender voice, the careworn kindly face of the human race. Let us walk together in the garden, dearest heart, not apart. They who know the sorrows other lives have known, never walk alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Birches by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp When I see birches bend to left and right Across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think some boy's been swinging them. But swinging doesn't bend them down to stay. Ice storms do that. Often you must have seen them, Loaded with ice a sunny winter morning after a rain, they click upon themselves as the breeze rises, and turn many-colored as the stir cracks and crazes their enamel. Soon the sun's warmth makes them shed crystal shells, shattering and avalanching on the snow-crust, such heaps of broken glass to sweep away you'd think the inner dome of heaven had fallen. They are dragged to the withered bracken by the load, and they seem not to break, though once they are bowed so low for long they never right themselves. You may see their trunks arching in the woods years afterwards, trailing their leaves on the ground like girls on hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun. But I was going to say when Truth broke in with all her matter of fact about the ice storm, now am I free to be poetical? I should prefer to have some boy bend them as he went out and in to fetch the cows, some boy too far from town to learn baseball whose only play was what he found himself, summer or winter, and could play alone. One by one he subdued his father's trees by riding them down over and over again until he took the stiffness out of them, and not one but hung limp, not one was left for him to conquer. He learned all there was to learn about not launching out too soon and so not carrying the tree away clear to the ground. He always kept his poise to the top branches, climbing carefully with the same pains you used to fill a cup up to the brim and even above the brim. Then he flung outward, feet first with a swish, kicking his way down through the air to the ground. So was I once myself, a swinger of birches, and so I dream of going back to be. It's when I'm weary of considerations and life is too much like a pathless wood where your face burns and tickles with the cobwebs broken across it and one eye is weeping from a twig's having lashed across it open. I'd like to get away from earth a while and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go better. 
I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow-white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be good, both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dulce et decorum est, read for LibriVox.org. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots, of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, in ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable souls on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce ectotum est pro patria mori. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Emperor of Ice Cream by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet Call the roller of big cigars the muscular one, And bid him whip in kitchen cups concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, And let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let be be the finale of seam, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs, that sheet on which she embroidered fantails once and spread it so as to cover her face. If her horny feet protrude, they come to show how cold she is and dumb. Let the lamp affix its beam, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Finis by Walter Savage Landor. Read for LibriVox.org by Lucy Perry. I strove with none, for none was worth my strife. Nature I loved, and next to nature, art. I warmed both hands before the fire of life. It sinks, and I am ready to depart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Invictus by William Ernest Henley Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman Out of the night that covers me, Black as the pit from pole to pole, I 
thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul in the fell clutch of circumstance i have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody but unbowed beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments the scroll i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul end of poem this recording is in the public domain jenny kissed me by lee hunt read for LibriVox.org by lucy perry jenny kissed me when we met jumping from the chair she sat in time you thief who love to get sweets into your list put that in say i'm weary say i'm sad say that health and wealth have missed me say i'm growing old but add jenny kissed me end of poem this recording is in the public domain Luke Havergal, read for LibriVox.org Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal. There where the vines cling crimson on the wall, And in the twilight wait for what will come. The wind will moan, the leaves will whisper some, Whisper of her, and strike you as they fall. But go, if you trust her, she will call. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal, Luke Havergal. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies To rift the fiery night that's in your eyes. But there, where western glooms are gathering, The dark will end the dark, if anything. God slays himself with every leaf that flies, And hell is more than half of paradise. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies, in eastern skies. Out of a grave I come to tell you this, out of a grave I come to quench the kiss that flames upon your forehead with a glow that blinds you to the way that you must go. Yes, there is yet one way to where she is, bitter but one that faith can never miss. Out of a grave I come to tell you this, to tell you this. There is a western gate, Luke Havergal. There are the crimson leaves upon the wall. Go, for the winds are tearing them away, nor think to riddle the dead words they say, nor any more to feel them as they fall. But go, and if you trust her, she will call. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mist by Henry David Thoreau. Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet. Low anchored cloud, Newfoundland air, fountainhead and source of rivers. Dew cloth, dream drapery, and napkin spread by fays. Drifting meadow of the air where bloom the daisied banks and violets, and in whose fenny labyrinth the bittern booms and heron wades. Spirit of lakes and seas and rivers, bear only perfumes and the scent of healing herbs to just men's fields. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Moonlit Apples by John Drinkwater Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Wallace At the top of the house the apples are laid in rows, And the skylight lets the moonlight in, And those apples are deep-sea apples of green. There goes a cloud on the moon in the autumn night. 
a mouse in the wainscot scratches and scratches and then there is no sound at the top of the house of men or mice and the cloud is blown and the moon again dapples the apples with deep sea light they are lying in rows there under the gloomy beams on the sagging floor they gather the silver streams out of the moon those moonlit apples of dreams and quiet is the steep stair under in the corridors under there is nothing but sleep and stiller than ever on orchard boughs they keep tryst with the moon and deep is the silence deep on moon-washed apples of wonder end of poem this recording is in the public domain My Boy Jack by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Wallace Have you news of my boy Jack? Not this tide. When do you think that he'll come back? Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Has anyone else had word of him? Not this tide. For what is sunk will hardly swim, Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Oh dear, what comfort will I find? None this tide, nor any tide, Except he did not shame his kind, Not even with that wind blowing and that tide. Then hold your head up all the more, This tide and every tide, because he was the son you bore, and gave to that wind blowing and that tide. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Translation from Anacreon, Ode Number Five, by Lord Byron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Mingle with the genial bowl, the rose, the floweret of the soul, the rose and grape together quaffed, how doubly sweet will be the draught. With roses crown our jovial brows, while every cheek with laughter grows, while smiles and songs with wine in sight, to wing our moments with delight. Rose by far the fairest birth, which spring in nature cull from earth, rose whose sweetest perfume given breathes our thoughts from earth to heaven rose whom the deities above from jove to hebe dearly love when cythria's blooming boy flies lightly through the dance of joy with him the graces then combine and rosy wreaths their locks entwine then will i sing divinely crowned with dusky leaves my temples bound Laeus, in thy bowers of pleasure, I wake a wildly thrilling measure. There will my gentle girl and I, among the mazes sportive fly, will bend before thy potent throne, rose wine and beauty, all my own. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Old Café by Arthur Macy Read for LibriVox by Lars Rolander You know, don't you, Joe, Those merry evenings long ago? You know the room, the narrow stair, The rest of smoke that circled there, The corner table where we sat For hours in after-dinner chat, And magnified our little world inside you know don't you joe ah those nights divine the simple frugal wine the airs on crude italian strings the joyous harmless revelings just fit for us or kings at times a quaint and wicked flask of rare chianti or from the homelier cask of modest pilsener a stein or so amid the merry talk 
would flow or red bordeaux from vines that grew where dear montaigne held his domain and you remember that dark eye none too shy in fact she seemed a bit too free for you and me you know don't you joe then pegasus i knew and then i read to you my callow rhymes so many many times and something in the place lent them a certain grace until i scarce believed them mine under the magic of the wine but now i read them o'er and see grave faults i had not seen before and wonder how you could have listened with such placid brow and somehow apprehend you sank the critic in the friend you know don't you joe and when we talked of books how learned were our looks and few the bards we could not quote from gay catullus lines to milton's purer note mayhap we now are wiser men but we knew more than all the scholars then and our conceit was grand ineffable complete we know don't we joe gone are those golden nights of innocent bohemian delights and we are getting on and anon years sad and tremulous may be in store for us but should we ever meet upon some quiet street and you discover in an old man's eye some transient sparkle of the days gone by then you will guess perchance the meaning of the glance you'll know won't you joe End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Realms of Gold by Alfred Noyes. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason Mills. Written after hearing a line of Keats repeated by a passing stranger under the palms of Southern California. Under the palms of San Diego where gold-skinned Mexicans loll at ease, and the red half-moons of their black-pipped melons drop from their hands in the sunset seas, and an incense out of the old brown missions blows through the orange trees, I wished that a poet who died in Europe had found his way to this rose-red west, that Keats had walked by the wide Pacific, and cradled his head on its healing breast, and made new songs of the sunburned sea-folk, new poems, perhaps his best, I thought of him under the ripe pomegranates, at the desert's edge where the grapevines grow, in a sun-kissed ranch between grey-green sagebrush and amethyst mountains peaked with snow, or watching the lights of the city of angels glitter like stars below. He should walk at dawn by the lemon orchards, and breathe at ease in that dry, bright air, and the Spanish bells in their crumbling cloisters of brown adobe would sing to him there and the old Franciscans would bring him their baskets of apple and olive and pear, and the mandolins in the deep blue twilight under that palm with the lion's mane would pluck once more at his golden heart-strings, and tell him the old sea-tales of Spain, and there should the daughters of Hesperus teach him their mystical songs again. Then the dusk blew sweet over seas of peach-bloom, the moon sailed white in the cloudless blue, the tree-toads purred and the crickets chirruped, and better than anything dreamed came true. For under the murmuring palms a shadow passed with the eyes I knew, a shadow perhaps of the tall green fountains that rustled their fronds on that glittering sky, a hungering shadow, a lean, dark shadow, a dreaming shadow that drifted by. But I heard him whisper the strange dark music that found it so rich to die. And the murmuring palms of San Diego shook with stars as he passed beneath the paradise palms and the wild white orchards the night and its roses were all one breath bearing the song of a nightingale seaward 
a song that had outsoared death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Separation by Walter Savage Lander Read for LibriVox.org by Florence Short There is a mountain and a wood between us Where the lone shepherd and late bird have seen us Morning and noon and even tide we pass Between us now the mountain and the wood Seem standing darker than last year they stood And say we must not cross Alas! Alas! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Friend by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman I ask but one thing of you, only one, That always you will be my dream of you, That never shall I wake to find untrue all this I have believed and rested on, forever vanished, like a vision gone out into the night. Alas, how few there are who strike in us a chord we knew existed, but so seldom heard its tone. We tremble at the half-forgotten sound. The world is full of rude awakenings and heaven-born castles shattered to the ground. Yet still our human longing vainly clings to a belief in beauty through all wrongs. O oh, stay your hand, and leave my heart its songs. End of poem. This recording's in the public domain. To the Cambro Britons and their harp. His Ballad of Agincourt by Michael Drayton Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Fair stood the wind for France When we our sails advance Nor now to prove our chance Longer will tarry But putting to the main of Coe The mouth of Seine With all his martial train Landed King Harry And taking many a fort Furnished in warlike sort Marcheth towards Agincourt in happy hour, skirmishing day by day with those that stopped his way, where the French general lay with all his power, which in his height of pride King Henry to deride, his ransom to provide to the king sending, which he neglects the while as from the nation vile, yet with an angry smile their fall portending, and turning to his men. Quoth thou brave Henry then, Though they to one be ten, Be not amazed, yet have we well begun, Battles so bravely won, Have ever to the sun by fame been raised. And for myself, quoth he, This my full rest shall be, England ne'er mourn for me, Nor more esteem me, Victor I will remain, Or on this earth lie slain, Never shall she sustain loss to redeem me. Poitier and Crecy tell, when most their pride did swell, under our swords they fell, no less our skill is than when our grandsire great, claiming the regal seat by many a warlike feat, lopped the French lilies. The Duke of York so dread the eager Varwood led, with the main Henry sped amongst his henchmen, Exeter had the rest, a braver man not there, O oh Lord, how hot they were on the false Frenchmen! They now to fight are gone, armour on armour shone, Drum now to drum did groan, to hear was wonder, That with cries they make, the very earth did shake, Trumpet to trumpet spake, thunder to thunder. Well it thine age became, O noble Erpingham, Which didst the signal aim to our hid forces, when from a meadow by, like a storm, suddenly the English archery struck the French horses. With Spanish yew so strong, arrows a cloth yard long, that like the serpent stung, piercing the weather, none from his fellows starts, but playing manly parts, and like true English hearts, stuck close together. 
when down their bows they threw, and forth their bilbos drew, and on the French they flew, not one was tardy. Arms were from shoulders sent, scalps to the teeth were rent, down the French peasants went, our men were hardy. This while our noble king, his broadsword brandishing, down the French host did ding, as to overwhelm it, and many a deep wound lent, his arms with blood besprent, and many a cruel dent bruised his helmet. Gloucester, that duke so good, next to the royal blood, for famous England stood with his brave brother, Clarence, in steel so bright, though but a maiden knight, yet in that furious fight scarce such another. Warwick in blood did wade, Oxford the foe invade, and cruel slaughter made, still as they ran up. Suffolk his axe did ply, Beaumont and Willoughby bear them right doughtily, Ferrers and Fanhope. Upon St. Crispin's day fought was this noble fray, which fame did not delay to England to carry. Oh, when shall Englishmen with such acts fill a pen, or England breed again such a King Harry? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To His Coy Love by Michael Drayton Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia I pray thee leave, love me no more. Call home the heart you gave me. I but in vain that saint adore, That can but will not save me. These poor half-kisses kill me quite. Was ever man thus served? Amidst an ocean of delight for pleasure to be starved? Show me no more those snowy breasts With azure riverettes branched, Where, whilst mine eye with plenty feasts, Yet is my thirst not stanched. O oh, Tantalus, thy pains ne'er tell, By me thou art prevented. Tis nothing to be plagued in hell, But thus in heaven tormented. Clip me no more in those dear arms, Nor thy life's comfort call me. O oh, these are but too powerful charms, And do but more enthrall me. But see how patient I am grown In all this coil about thee. Come, a nice thing, let thy heart alone, I cannot live without thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.